one participant shared that the K-State Garden Hour series is delightful, informative, and helpful. Eight out of 10 K-State Garden Hour participants reported increasing their physical and or emotional health through the skills they gained in our webinars. 82% of Kansas Garden Hour participants harvested fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs they grew with the help of our webinars. 90% of K-State Garden Hour participants reported they used unbiased and research-based information to solve plant and garden problems after participating in our webinars. Plant heroes wear purple. Discover K-State Garden Hour at ksre-learn.com slash k-state garden hour and become your own garden superhero. All right. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to the uh, the twenty or the February edition of the twenty twenty three K State Garden Hour webinar series. Uh, glad to have you all here with us today. Um, this webinar series started in twenty twenty and has been a collaboration of the entire K State uh, Horticulture Extension team. And since uh, the start of the program, we've reached over forty three thousand gardeners, <clears throat> just like you. And we're pleased to continue offering the K-State Garden Hour series for free. And uh, if you've enjoyed these educational webinars, we'd invite you to please consider making a tax deductible don donation to support uh, our program. And the link to, to donate can be found in the chat or on our K-State Garden Hour website. And we do appreciate your support. This webinar is hosted by K-State Research and Extension, and my name is Jason Graves, and I am the horticulture agent here in the central Kansas district uh, in the central part of the state. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Uh, most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline, uh, but most of all, we all have a share for educating and sharing these important gardening topics. And uh, I'll say I'm greatly looking forward to our topic today. And before we get started, we do just have a couple quick housekeeping notes to cover. Um, if you would please use the Q&A feature for questions related to the presentation. Uh, this is where we're gonna be looking for questions at the end of the webinar and uh, during the, the question and answer session. So you should see a button along with the bottom tab that says Q&A. And so if you just click on that, you'll be able to enter your question. Uh, as a reminder, today's webinar will also be recorded, and we will post that uh, to our K-State Garden Hour website. Uh, we typically upload uh, the video and the additional resources for each topic, um, and they should be on our website uh, soon after the presentation. So uh, our moderators today are Annie Baker uh, and Calla Edwards, and so look forward to having them uh, interacting uh, with you on, on questions. So feel free to, uh, like I said, use that Q&A uh, if you need to, or uh, chat as well. So today's topic is uh, more plants from your plants, and we're, we're gonna cover an introduction to vegetative plant propagation. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, who is uh, Dr. Jason Griffin. Uh, currently, Dr. Griffin serves as the director of the John C. Pear Horticulture Center in Wichita, and so we're pretty excited to spend the next hour with him today learning about vegetative plant propagation. So I'm going to invite Jason to jump on and we'll transition into the slides. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jason. I appreciate that introduction and welcome everybody and good afternoon or morning if you're west of the central time zone. Let me share my screen here. And there we are. So I'm really excited to actually to uh, get a chance to chat with you guys about one of my favorite topics, which is plant propagation. Um, just as a, as a cautionary um, statement, I'll just say everything we're gonna talk about today, this is gonna be a broad overview um, each slide I'm going to put up here today could probably be a lecture on its own. So it's a very broad overview, hopefully give you a little more information, um, some resources, perhaps to, to hunt down some more information on your own. Um, I have been propagating plants, oh gosh, for 30 years. My, my master's degree was in plant propagation, and it's been a, a passion of mine for, for my entire professional career. 
um, there's something really exciting about generating new plants, uh, whether it's whether from seed or cutting or grafting. Um, but it's a it's a really fun topic. It's a fun part of horticulture. Um, so we'll just start off with, so we are not talking about sexual propagation, which is seed. Um, if you're interested in growing plants from seed, which is fantastic, by the way, there's, there's nothing more gratifying than planting a seed and watching a, a plant grow from it. Um, but if you're interested in that, look back exactly one year, I think, to the day. Um, we had uh, the, the, the Kansas Garden Hour was on starting seeds inside. Um, so you can you can find that information there. Today we are talking about asexual or vegetative propagation, um, sometimes known as cloning, or a few different terms that, that people throw out there. But it's it's vegetative or, or asexual propagation. Um, we're going to look at cuttings, which are either stem, leaf, or root. Um, we'll talk about about grafting, layering. Um, I don't know. We probably won't get to bulbs or tissue culture. Um, Tissue culture is is not not for the home gardener. That's that's for sure. So if, if you're interested in that, um, you're going to have to look look elsewhere than, than than here. There are a ton of resources out there um, on plant propagation. Uh, these are just some books I pulled off my shelf real real quickly, and some of them are classroom textbooks. Um, some of them are are very specific. Um, you can see this one here is specifically on cutting propagation. This is the sort of the Bible to grafting, um, the, the grafter's handbook. Um, manual Woody Landscape Plants, we use that for, you know, landscape plant materials and, um, but every single, it, it's all um, alphabetized by, by genus, but every, every species in there practically, he gives a, a, a real brief um, discussion of, of how to propagate it. Um, this is the textbook that every class across the country practically uses. Um, and don't shy away from the old stuff either. This is Prin Principles of Plant Propagation um, from 1927. Uh, is it current? No, but what I like about these old, these old books is the pictures, the diagrams they give you, and they often did not have the technology that we have today. So they did things in a manner which you could probably repeat in your home garden uh, pretty easily. Houseplants, if you're interested in that, you know, Almost every used bookstore in America has a dozen old books on houseplants. And every single one of those books on houseplants has a chapter in there on, on propagation. You can pick them up for five bucks at your local used bookstore and, and the, the, the techniques for propagating interior plants hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, if I were looking at this and I, there was one or two that I could not go without, um, it would be this one right here, the Reference Manual of Woody Plant Propagation by Durenheiser. Um, it's a fantastic, the first half of the book is a kind of a nice discussion of, of plant propagation techniques and practices. The second half of the book is an alphabetical listing of woody plant species and how to propagate them from seed, cuttings, tissue culture, uh, so that's kind of the whole discussion. Um, I, that's, that's the first one I go to if I'm interested in propagating plant X and I wanna know how it's been done before, that's the one I go to. So there's lots of resources out there. There's also some great websites. I think somebody's gonna put those in the chat. Um, there's some great websites out there too, so. So why? Why in the world, if you can grow from seed, why in the world do we do this asexual propagation or this vegetative propagation? Um, one of the easiest ways I like to describe this to, to people who aren't experienced in propagation is to explain to them that a seed is, a, a, a plant generated from a seed is not genetically identical to the parent plant. Much like your children are not genetically identical to you, to mom or dad, their, their genes are a combination of mom and dad. So, although I'm not sure what I contributed to my daughter, but she's all mom anyway. Um, but seedlings are genetic combinations of mom and dad parents. Um, that is not what a lot of nurseries want. They want clones. They want genetically identical plants. They want cookie cutters because it's easy to grow, it's easy to propagate. And if you want, this is a field of autumn blaze maples, love them or hate them, that's, that's what they are. Um, if you want autumn blaze, you want autumn blaze. You don't want something that's kind of autumn blaze-ish, you want the real thing. So that's why we vegetatively or asexually propagate these plants. So we get genetically identical clones so that everyone looks just like the other. 
and you don't get that from, from seeds. Start with uh, cuttings uh, and, and cutting propagation is incredibly popular. Every nursery across the country does it. You can do it in simple ways in your garage, shed, kitchen. Um, cuttings can be done by stem. They can be done by leaf cuttings. They can be done by root cuttings. Stem cuttings are the most popular. Uh, and we'll talk about these. Um, widely used method across the country. Um, it's relatively expensive. It's pretty easy to do. It makes efficient use of, of space. You can put a lot of cuttings. Um, you get uniform if you do it right. Um, if, you're, if you're a good propagator and you do it right, you can get very uniform results and it's really efficient. Uh, efficient use of space, efficient use of resources, efficient use of plant material, uh, and, it, and it works pretty well. Cuttings can be stem, leaf, or root cuttings. Over here on the left, we've got some uh, just typical little stem cuttings of an American elm that we did a couple years ago. It's generally four to eight inches. We certainly shoot for about six inches, strip the leaves off the base. Um, we cut the, the remaining leaves in half just to save space. Um, we'll treat those and get those rid. That's a typical stem cutting. When you mention leaf, if you were to Google leaf cuttings, you would get picture after picture after picture of begonias. It's sort of the, the the textbook example of leaf cuttings where you just kind of score the underside of the leaf, press it down under the rooting substrate, keep it humid, and, and, and um, new plants generate from that. It's a typical leaf cutting. This is also a leaf cutting from snake plant. You can slice that leaf, put it in your, your rooting environment. We'll talk about rooting environments. Um, it'll generate roots, and then it generates a new plant that comes right out of the, out of the cut base. Interesting to note on snake plant, this new plantlet arising from right here will be all green. They won't have the yellow margins. The only way to propagate the, the very one with the yellow margins is, uh, is division. Um, but we're not talking about division today, we're talking about other forms. And top right, we have um, mimosa root cutting. Root cuttings generally are not done uh, in, in the nursery industry it, anyway. Um, you can do them in, in your home, you can do them in your yard, they're pretty easy to do. There's not a lot of, don't require a lot of resources, don't require a lot of space. Generally think about plants which tend to spread via rhizomes or stolons or plants which generate a lot of suckers. They're gonna be the most likely to be successful from root cuttings. You can see here the propagator took about a six inch root of cutting, roughly pencil diameter, because it's got lots of nice carbohydrates stored in it. Um, take that cutting in the winter, this time of year, if you're interested in root cuttings, this time of year, because those roots are full of carbohydrates, they got all their energy stored up in them. Take a um, six to eight inch length, pencil diameter, put it in, uh, lay it horizontally in a, a flat of potting substrate, keep it humid, and it sends up shoots. Again, works best with plants which tend to sucker or spread by stolons or, or, or rhizomes. Some of the steps involved in, in cutting propagation. Um, and we'll go over these a little bit. Obviously, we need to collect our cuttings, um, treat them with a root promoting hormone. There's chemicals out there which can help your cuttings promote, um, generate roots. We'll talk about those. Um, insert it into a rooting substrate. We like to use, um, we make our own three parts perlite to one part peat moss. Um, there are other things that you can use. We'll chat about that. Maintain the proper rooting environment, very important. And then patience. Patience, patience, patience. 30 years I've been propagating and I still can't wait to take a peek and see if those cuttings have got roots. Um, four weeks is on the early end for really easy to root stuff. Uh, if you're trying to you know, root a magnolia cutting, you're gonna be up to the 14, 16 week time period. Um, so be patient. Uh, an experienced propagator once told me when I was a younger man, he said cuttings will do, th do two things. They will root or they will die. We'll wait till one of them happens. Um, so be patient. And then transplanting, hardening them off, and, um, and growing them off for there. Sanitation is huge. Um, if you visit a, a professional nursery, commercial nursery, you will see the propagation facility is generally a pretty clean facility. Um, you can imagine a, a cutting that has no roots um, is really susceptible to pathogens, 
insects, um, anything that would delay the, the generation of roots is going to put that cutting at risk. So sanitation is really, really key. Um, diseases in your propagation facility are, are no good. Collecting your cuttings. Um, so probably one of the most important things, and it's gonna sound really, really obvious, is take plants from, take cuttings from healthy plants. Um, the physiological condition of the stock plant is really important. You want to make sure you're taking cuttings from a plant that is not under moisture stress, right? You're, you're going to cut, take that cutting and remove it from its root system. It doesn't need to be under moisture stress already. So we, to help with that, we try to take cuttings from plants that have been irrigated. We try to take them in the morning. Um, we don't, we won't go out and collect cuttings afternoon. There's, there's just no reason to do that. They're already water stressed. Why, why it, why add complications to, to the process? So we take cuttings in the morning. Um, if we're taking them here, then they go right into the right into the greenhouse for processing. Um, if we are out on the road um, in, in ice chest and plastic bags and um, driving just slightly at the speed limit is probably I, ideal to get back here as quickly as possible to process. We want to keep them moist. We want to keep them humid so that they don't dry out. Nutrition of the stock plant is really important as well. You do not want to be taking cuttings from a plant which is showing signs of, you know, iron chlorosis or just general poor growth or nitrogen deficiency. It's just, it, again, it, it needs to survive for several weeks while it's generating roots. So a plant which is already stressed is no good. The age of the stock plant is really, really important. As your plant matures, the ability of it to generate new roots goes downhill rapidly. Younger plants, definitely better for propagation. Um, and then the growth stage, probably one of the most important things is, is growth stage. We classify cuttings um, with regards to growth stage as hardwood, softwood, or semi-hardwood. Hardwood is generally any time after a hard freeze until they start to to, to push new growth in the spring. So right now you're taking cuttings. These are hardwood cuttings. Softwood cuttings generally think May, April, May, June in our area when plants are actively growing. That's a softwood cutting. They need to be treated as such. And then semi-hardwood cuttings are generally after growth stops, but before that freeze. So af after they've already set a terminal bud, um, the, the wood's firmed up a little bit. It's, it's not soft. You can't bend them. Um, they've got a nice, nice good terminal bud and, they've, and they have not received a, a freeze yet. That's some hardwood. Really important um, when it comes to propagating plants. Some plants will only root at one stage and not another. Some plants only root hardwood. Good luck rooting them any other time of the year, softwood, any other time of the year. I mean, it's, not, it's really important. Um, and most of those textbooks I mentioned will say that. We'll give you hints on which ones. Age, um, some work done years ago on, on Virginia pine for Christmas tree production. And you can see they were maintaining stock plants. On the left, we've got cuttings from a two-year-old stock plant, rooted fairly well. On the right, you've got cuttings from a five-year-old stock plant. So just a few years, that transition from juvenile to mature happens really quickly and the rooting goes way, way down. Again, the juvenile versus mature parts of the tree, the, the, the most juvenile part of the tree is in this area, closest to the ground. Um, think about it, as this tree grows and gets taller and taller, up here is where you get flowers and fruit, which are a sign of maturity. Um, down here, you get young, vigorous shoots. So um, root suckers, um, if you were to cut this tree off and it sends up a bunch of stump sprouts, those would be considered juvenile. Even on a hundred year old tree, if storm takes it out, um, some for whatever reason has to be cut down and it sends up a bunch of shoots, those shoots are, are juvenile. They come from the juvenile portion of the tree and they would root better than the growth way up here at the top. Um, so think about that when you're collecting cuttings. A younger plant is better. If you are working with an older plant, go to the juvenile portion of, of the plant. You have much better, much better success. Growth stage. Uh, this is a greenhouse full of crepe myrtle cuttings. Crepe myrtles really well in softwood cuttings. Uh, active growth before they flower, sometime in May or June, get those cuttings. You get really high percentages. We've tried rooting hardwood cuttings with 
really, really poor success. Um, crab myrtles really prefer to be um, propagated during during softwood growth, and they root really well, um, and they take off after that. Elms, we've tried elms with hardwood, and they they just don't want to do it very well. They they just they just don't want to root very well. Um, softwood cuttings tend to they're actively growing. They tend to wilt too fast, and they don't root. But semi-hardwood cuttings that we take maybe early July tend to root pretty well. So these are American elms, you know, four to six inch cuttings treated with uh, a rooting hormone. And they, they rooted fairly, fairly well. The trick is getting those out potted up and getting new growth on them uh, before they harden off for, for winter. Um, pushing new growth on a rooted cutting is important so that they can grow new roots, grow new shoots, store new carbohydrates before they go into the dormant season. That is a, a tricky part of propagation with some of these plants is getting that new growth after they root. A little bit about rooting hormones. Um, there's a lot of options out there. There's a lot of products. They all can say, contain basically the same two or three compounds in them. Um, they just have different names on them. We, uh, for our research purposes, we start here with these chemical grade compounds that we buy from a chemical supply company. These are probably unavailable to to most of you out there, um, but that's okay. There are lots of products you can buy over, over the counter. They almost all contain IBA, which is indolbutyric acid, or NAA, which is naphthalene acetic acid, there won't be a spelling test, don't worry. Um, and some of them contain both IBA and NAA. And it depends on the plant. Uh, IBA is the most common. It's in most of the products. It's very stable. Um, and it works really, really well, which is why it's the most common. NAA is not quite as stable. Uh, it breaks down relatively rapidly in sunlight or, or temperatures that aren't real favorable. Um, but some plants prefer NAA. Some plants prefer a combination of IBA and NAA. Some products like root tone has a uh, fungicide incorporated with it. So you're, you're dipping in a, um, you're putting your, a rooting hormone on your cutting with a, um, with a fungicide in it to help prevent uh, rot from occurring during the rooting process. But here's a common product you can buy um, from a horticulture supply company. You can buy a still buy root tone out there. It's been around forever. But a really nice resource out there for you, uh, Dr. Boyer put together several years ago. If you were to Google KSU MF3105, that's the number that our publications um, department puts on them. So just Google KSU MF3105. This will come right up to the top of the search. It's a nice document that goes through using root promoting root promoting hormones on your on your cuttings the the do's and don'ts the how to um, how to mix them uh, one of my favorites is this table that's in there and you can find these rooting hormones in powder formulation or they can be liquid or the new one is kind of a, a gel um, we've only used the powder in, in, in liquid so far but as this table will give you the concentration, you can see there are different concentrations of IBA, endobuteric acid in those compounds. Um, even, though they, even though they have different names, it's the same active ingredient in there. The liquid uh, formulations are really well. Dip and Grow has been around since the earth cooled. It's one of the oldest um, root promoting hormones out there. Um, it's, been, it's been around forever. It's got IBA and NAA in it. Um, then there are some water soluble formulations. I know there's a lot here. These are, these liquid formulations are dissolved in alcohol because the chemical does not dissolve readily in water, but these formulations do dissolve in water. So depending on whether or not your plant you're interested in is sensitive to alcohol or not. And again, those books that we referenced earlier, mention that in there when you're looking at how to propagate plant X, it will say use water soluble or alcohol. Um, so th those options are out there for you. Anyway, good publication, lots of information in there. Go ahead and download it if you wanna learn more about using these root promoting hormones. 
This is the powder formulation. Um, the chemical is, is suspended in talcum powder. Um, so you can see they've got a little beaker of water here. So they take that cutting, dip it in water so that the talc sticks to it. Uh, dip it in the, in the talcum powder here that's got the hormone in it and then insert it into the rooting substrate over there. Pretty, pretty simple process. And these products do work. Uh, every nursery uses them because they do work. Uh, this is some work we did several years ago looking at uh, propagation of some, some waste bark elm cultivars we were interested in. And we were looking at different IBA concentrations, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, or 20,000 parts per million. Um, and you can see with no IBA, we got practically no rooting, 0% here in the yellow line, almost no rooting. As little as 5,000 parts per million, we got up to you know, 62, 63%. Up to 10,000, we were close to 100% rooting, which is pretty good on an elm. You can see with increasing concentrations, we really didn't see any decline or obviously couldn't get much better than 100%. So, um, but not only is it about rooting percentage, it's about root number as well. So with each increasing root promoting hormone concentration increase, we got more roots. For the professional plant propagator, it's not just about rooting percent, it's also about root number and root quality. Uh, a cutting with, with one skinny root on it is technically rooted, but it's not a very high quality cutting. They want cuttings with lots of roots on them so they can pot them up and off they go. Um, but these root pruning compounds do work. They definitely do work. Just an example, same, same cuttings, the lace bark elm see zero, no, no rooting hormone, no roots, and good rooting from there on out, um, but definitely more roots as the concentration increased. So don't hesitate to um, hunt these down your local garden shop or horticulture supply company. They do work if you're interested in, in rooting cuttings. About the rooting substrate. Um, the purpose of the rooting substrate is to hold the cutting in place. Keep it upright, hold it in place, and carry enough moisture or water vapor uh, so that the base of the cutting doesn't dry out, but not so much that it drowns. So air space and moisture is a nice balance there, which is why we use a three parts perlite to one part peat moss. Um, different propagators will find their own happy blend. Uh, if you are in a part of the country that doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight when you are propagating, you might want to go with 100% perlite. I've seen people do that because it drains really well and won't hold too much moisture. Um, if you're in a part of the country and you're, you're going to be dumping a lot of moisture, humidity, mist on those, um, you want a well aerated, a well aerated substrate. So we generally, like I said, we go with the three parts perlite to one part peat moss, but I've seen people use these jiffy plugs and you just soak them in water, they swell up. I've seen people use those with good success on easy to root species. Um, I would not use those on difficult to root species. I think they might hold a little too much moisture for too long. Um, there's this rock wool um, cubes you can buy almost anywhere now. And they also are quite common in greenhouse production for um, various greenhouse crops for, for propagation. Good. They hold the right amount of moisture. They're well aerated, lots of airspace. Uh, so it's a good blend of, of moisture and airspace. Um, some people, for again, for easy to use stuff, bag of potting soil works. Um, if your cutting is one of those that's going to root in four or five weeks, no problem. Um, you can just buy a bag of potting soil and, and use that. So there's lots of different things out there, um, and there's there's more than this. Um, but there's lots of different substrates you can use. The important part is they hold the cutting up. Um, they don't shrink. They don't dry out too fast. Uh, if they're weed free, they're disease free. You want to definitely have something that's that's sterile because um, you don't want to be in, introducing any any diseases into your into your cutting propagation facility. This is a um, this is an example of, of hardwood cuttings. We mentioned softwood and semi hardwood. Um, these are hardwood cuttings. Um, the nurse nurse we visited, they're proud of their brand new um, hardwood propagation greenhouse. And it's, it's a, it was a really nice facility. This is the kind of stuff, you're not gonna build a greenhouse at home, but you, hardwood cuttings are a really easy way to get into propagation at home because the cuttings don't take a whole lot. They have no leaves on them. 
Um, so they're not transpiring a lot of water. They're not gonna dehydrate. And the, the trick here is, you can see it's pretty cool. We've all got our, we've got our jackets on in there. It's pretty cool in there. Um, keeping the, the tops of these cuttings cool so that they don't break bud and start to grow, but keeping the base of the cuttings warm. So there's physiological activity down there because you need cell division and you need root growth before the tops start to break bud and grow. You want root production before you have leaf production. So it's cool in there. It's around 45 degrees because um, it's the winter and the cuttings aren't growing. So it's 45 degrees, nice and cool. And underneath this gravel, they've got hot water pipes. There's a hot water tank just outside this door here. And they've got hot water pipes running underneath there. So the base of those cuttings is about 72, 75 degrees. The top is around 45 degrees. So you get lots of cellular activity, cell division uh, at the base of the cuttings, hopefully, so you get roots before top growth. And you can see they do have some irrigation here so they can keep it moist if they have to, because they don't want it to dry out. Um, that's a pretty darn good hardwood cutting propagation facility. Um, they, had, they had pretty good success in them. So the, a little bit about the environment during rooting. Um, so the, I mean, obviously the, the priority is to keep your, your cuttings from drying out before roots are produced. You separated that cutting from its root system. You need new roots before it puts on a lot of growth. So keeping that leaf and, and shoot tissue hydrated is really important. So we wanna keep the top high humidity, uh, relatively cool. I mean, even in the summer, we want to we, we work in the greenhouse or wherever we are. We want to keep the top relatively cool as we can. Um, and the bottom, we want to keep nice and warm. So we encourage that, that cellular division. So we do that through some mist, fog, um, any sort of plastic, uh, anything, any sort of vapor barrier um, and no direct sunlight because we don't want the sun actually hitting the leaves warming up the leaves and causing them to transpire water faster. So we keep direct sunlight off the leaves. The bottom, we want to keep relatively warm, 70, 75 degrees. Um, and we want to keep that humid as well. We're trying to encourage roots there. So again, mist, fog, so some sort of vapor barrier. Um, and we, we use bottom heat um, to keep that bottom warm. This is old school mist. Um, there's newer technologies, but these things work really great. These little flat fan spray, uh, pressurized water hits a flat surface and disperses. Uh, that is hooked up to a valve, which is hooked up to a clock. And that mist is gonna turn on about every six, seven, eight minutes. It's gonna turn on for about five or six seconds. Fill up that chamber with mist and then it's off for five, six, eight minutes. And it kicks on again for five, six, seven seconds and miss the whole thing. So it goes through these periods of mist and then it dries down just a little bit and then mist again. So we're keeping high humidity, providing water. There's bottom heat underneath there. And that's, a, that's an old school sort of mist chamber that um, you could build with parts from your local hardware store. This is a fog chamber. Um, fog is, is not, fog is not new. Fog, fogging has been around for a long time for propagation, um, but the technology has increased, has come a long way. So you can do fog pretty easily these days. And there's a lot of propagators who swear by fog. Um, they feel like it provides less water to the cutting. So we're not saturating the base of the cuttings. Um, there's, they feel like there's less disease issues in a fog chamber than there is with mist. Um, and fog is no doubt, it doesn't go through the moist and then dries a little bit and then moist and dries a little bit. It's 100% humidity 100% of the time. So this is a greenhouse with a, a fog chamber. This is our fog chamber um, that we use in our greenhouse, again, with parts that you literally can buy at your, at your hardware store. Um, this is a little plastic chamber with PVC pipe we've built, piece of plastic holding it in. Um, and this is a residential uh, humidifier. We stole this design from Dr. Kerry Rivard and his um, tomato grafting. Um, so this is generating 
fog and pumping it inside. So it's just dumping all this fog right in here, except it's all closed up. This blue mat here is a heat mat. So we've got a thermostat on there, keeping the base of those cuttings around 70 to 75 degrees, 100% humidity all the time. And we get fairly good success in there. Um, this, is, this is new to us. We've only been using it for, for about a year. We've still got some kinks to work out. Um, but for small scale propagation, where we don't need to use the whole greenhouse for our mist system, we just need a couple of flats to propagate a few cuttings. Uh, this has worked out really, really well for us. The, um, the humidifier producing the fog is hooked up to a timer, so it kicks on at seven o'clock in the morning and it goes off at midnight when the lights in the greenhouse go off. So as long as it's the cuttings are under light, they're getting fog as well. That's, that's been pretty successful for us uh, recently. We've, we've been pretty happy with that. There's other ways, um, these, these little humid domes. So here's your, your flats with your seedlings or cuttings. Um, and it's just this little dome, plastic dome that goes over the top of it. Keeps it, you'll see condensation build in there. You get 100% humidity. This design has vents on it. So you can open it up and let, let the humidity out. Um, this is a bottom heat mat that you can buy at any horticulture supply store. There's a, um, this is the uh, temperature probe that is inserted in there, which, um, kicks on the um, kicks on the, the the heating units and then the mats heat up. Um, so it's, it's really really simple. Doesn't take any more than a than an outlet um, to get that bottom heat on there. Really efficient and you know quite honestly for ease for easy stuff to propagate for your your home house plants um, for your exterior shrubs that are really easy. This works as well. A pot with potting soil with your cutting stuck with a root promoting hormone on it, place a plastic bag over the top of it, twice a day, lift that up, mist it with a, a handheld sprayer, put the plastic bag back over it and put it somewhere out of direct sunlight. You don't want it in direct sunlight because it'll, it'll be like an oven in there if the sun hits it. So keep it out of direct sunlight and you're gonna see condensation form in there. And for easy to root stuff, that works really well. Um, there's no, no, no problems with, with that at all. You wouldn't want to try and root difficult to root items in there, but for easy to root stuff, that would work. Hardening off is an important part of the propagation procedure. If you have a cutting in this warm, humid environment, the leaves that are produced after that roots, the leaves that are produced have practically no cuticle, no waxes on them. They have no protection from UV light or low humidity um, air. So we need to harden these things off. So you don't root a plant, yank it out of the, the fog chamber or the mist bench, pot it up and stick it outside. It will cook. Um, so we need to slowly reduce the mist. When you know your, your plants are rooting, we need to slowly reduce the mist, slowly reduce the fog, start hardening them off. Um, if you're using that plastic bag over the pot, you cut the corners off the, off the plastic bag, lift the bag up a little bit for a couple hours during the day before you put it back down. Basically, you're slowly acclimating that rooted cutting to lower humidity and more intense sunlight. Um, and slowly do that, and then this should be off and running without, without any trouble. You just can't do it abruptly. I mentioned layering. Um, layering doesn't take any special tools. You don't need a mist bench. You don't need a fog chamber. Um, you don't need bottom heat. Um, layering is a pretty effective way of, of propagating plants. Um, the advantage is that your new plant is not removed from the parent plant until it's already got roots. Um, so you, you, you avoid that whole issue of, oh my gosh, we gotta get roots on this thing before it dies. So your, your, your plant is still attached to the mother plant, still getting water and nutrients from the mother plant before you separate it. Um, it does use a little more space. It does um, not as efficient. You can't get as many cuttings per plant, um, but for, for a little bit of, of, of home plant, uh, in particular for interior plant propagation, it, it works pretty well. The air layering, tip layering, uh, mound layering or, or stooling it's called um, are a couple of different types. We'll take a, take a look at a couple of them. This would be your um, 
textbook error layering method. Um, some pictures I had to steal because I have not done error layering a lot. And when I've tried it, I have failed miserably because I am way too impatient. Um, but the procedure is pretty simple. It works well on easy to root plants. It works well on interior plants. The procedure is pretty simple. Um, wound the stem. And once you've got the stem wounded, you can use a root promoting hormone on that. Um, if it's the talc, you can rub a little bit of that talc on it, or you can brush a little bit of the, the liquid on it. And then it's wrapped in some moist sphagnum moss, wrapped up in plastic to keep it moist. And then people often wrap it in like tin foil or something like that to keep light off it because sunlight and roots don't mix very well. Um, so a little tin foil or something to keep the light off. And then you just wait and you wait and you wait and you can peel the tin foil and look. And when eventually you start to see those roots fill up that plastic bag, you know you're ready to go. So you just cut it off below the roots, um, not up here, but down here, cut it off below the roots and pot it up and should be off and running and, and ready to go. It's, a, it's an old school technique. It's pretty simple. Uh, the procedure is pretty simple to do and it does work fairly well for, for lots of interior plants. Mound layering um, is one that we have done several times um, and had really good success with it. it we res <laughs> We resort to mound layering or, or stooling when we're dealing with plants that are really, really stubborn, plants that are really difficult to root. Uh, this, the advantage of this system is it's got lots of time for roots to develop and the new plant is still attached to the mother plant root system. So, it, so it, it's fine. It, take us, it would take years if we, want to, if we wanted to wait. Um, Justin Brock, master student we had, did, did some work on, on mound layering of Shantung maple and cattle maples. Um, so you know, if you have tried to remove weedy trees in your landscape or in your windbreak, you cut them off. If you don't treat that stump, it sends up a bunch of new shoots. And that's the, the, that's the justification, that's the theory behind, behind this layering. We, it's those new shoots that we use the, to become new plants. So we had these maples, we, um, you can see they're around six to eight inches um, caliper. We cut them off in the spring uh, before the new growth started. And what happens is all of these new shoots generate from the base of that plant. So you, the, the root system's still alive. We've got all these epicormic buds underneath the bark. So you cut that top off and all those buds break and the plant sends up a bunch of new shoots. So we strip all the leaves off those. We, um, we, we did wanna treat these with hormone because they are very difficult to, to propagate asexually. So we had our fancy schmancy uh, plant hormone container here with our fancy schmancy um, plant hormone application device or foam brush. And we just brushed a little bit of this, this hormone onto these shoots as they were, as they were coming up. We wounded some of them you know, to help the hormone get in there. We didn't wound others, um, but we brushed that hormone onto that new growth. Then take some sort of device. You can use whatever you want. We used 10 gallon containers. We cut the bottoms off, inverted them, um, put them over the top and filled it with potting soil. So we've got those new shoots coming up through there. We have treated it with a hormone. They're still attached to the mother plant. Those things could sit there. They, they would just keep growing for years and years if we didn't do anything. Um, kept it moist. Obviously, we need to keep that, that rooting area in here moist because we're trying to get roots to fill this area. So we let it go all summer long. We did that in the spring. We let it go all summer long. And in the fall, lift that container off and start to peel away the soil. And you can see all these new roots that had developed on those stems. And on a sugar maple, a caddo sugar maple, that's not a bad root system. So you cut that off, pot that up, or take it to the field, plant it, um, and that becomes, your, that becomes your new plant. So it does work for plants which are difficult to propagate by other means, difficult to asexually propagate by other means. Um, you can't root cuttings of caddo maple. Shantung is really, really difficult. Um, this worked pretty well. To, to clone these plants. We've done it with oak as well. So this is, you could do this in your home landscape pretty easy. This is a, uh, 
this was a two-year-old um, Texas red oak. We, we love Texas red oak. So we had a two-year-old Texas red oak inside this green container growing up in the spring. Um, we chopped it off. It sent up a half a dozen new shoots. We did the same thing, treated those new shoots, took this two gallon container, cut the base off it, inverted it on top of the other one, filled it with potting substrate, kept it moist. And by the end of the um, time fall came along, came along, we just lifted that two gallon container off and we had this nice root system inside there. So it, it, it does work. Um, it works well for, for difficult to root items. Um, we're pretty, pretty happy with, with how that worked. Just a little bit on grafting. Um, I don't want to take too much, but I think there's some things about grafting that you probably need to know. If you want to practice, um, you can, again, grafting does take a lot of skill um, and practice, uh, but you don't necessarily need a greenhouse. You don't necessarily need mist chambers, fog chambers. You can, you can graft right on your back deck if you wanted to. Um, so what we're doing is we're joining two different plants together and hopefully they make a nice union and they become a new plant. This is English walnut that's grafted onto black walnut. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the difference in the, in the bark textures. Um, we talked a little bit about budding, which is another form of grafting where the, um, um, the new plant is generated from this one bud. So you're taking one bud from the plant you want, putting it onto a root system of another plant, and hopefully they they hopefully it grows off, get a good bud union and it grows off well. Um, we talk about scion and stock. I'll use those terms. The scion is the portion of the plant that you are trying to propagate. Uh, in this case right here, it's a contorted bald cypress. We're trying to propagate that because cuttings don't root very well. So we are going to be doing some grafting here. So we've got a seedling bald cypress that we are grafting this one into. So stock and scion. Grafting does take a fair amount of skill. It takes time. Um, we use it when we can't propagate plants from, from cuttings. Um, so it's a nice way to propagate something that won't root from cuttings. Um, we use it for size control. If you have a dwarfing root stock, you can dwarf your plant um, like apple orchards. The reason apple trees aren't 40 feet tall anymore is because of dwarfing root stocks. Um, or we get specialized growth forms. We'll take a look at those. Uh, so plants that don't root very well by other means, canardi eastern red cedar, cuttings don't root, it's got to be grafted. Taylor eastern red cedar, cuttings won't root, so it's got to be grafted. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't get those. Um, weeping cherries, uh, cuttings don't root very well, so they're grafted. These are grafted a little bit higher, so I, the seedling, the root stock, is this whole tree up to about four and a half, five feet, and then they graft up here at the top. That's why you can see those funky looking, um, that graft union. Uh, get this funky little growth right there where all that, that grafting takes place. Uh, those little pom-pom trees that you see, this is a lilac, I believe, grafted onto a standard up here. And there's, there's the graft union. Things to be aware of. Um, the rootstock can outgrow the, the plant that you want. This is a variegated dogwood uh, that's grafted onto a seedling dogwood, which is not variegated. And you can see the, the root system suckered. And because it's not variegated, it's got more green, more chlorophyll, more carbohydrates, it outgrew the variegated portion. So you've got to keep your eye open for root suckers. This is one of those Taylor junipers, same thing. Um, the root stock, which is a Hetz juniper, kind of sent up a little, a little shoot off the, off the side and it's got to be cut out of there. Otherwise it will, it will take over. Same thing, you've seen this in the spring driving around. Crab apple, obviously a homeowner at one point bought this nice weeping white crab apple. Sucker popped up and it was never cut off. And you can see that that sucker of the root system quickly outgrew the cultivar that the homeowner wanted. Um, so, I mean, nobody needs that. That's, that's not pretty at all. So you gotta prune those suckers off when they, when they come up. Things to be aware of, stock and scion need to be compatible. You can't graft you know, a peach tree onto an oak. They've gotta be closely related, preferably the same species. Um, you've gotta know what you're doing to match up the right tissues. You need to protect the surfaces from drying out, which is why we use this paraffin wax. And then the aftercare is, is pretty important. 
is those bald cypress. This was our technique, a, a wedge graft right in the top. We use a basically a budding rubber, a rubber band to keep them tight together, insert them into this rubber made bin. We essentially bury them in moist peat moss for a few weeks, piece of row cover over the top to keep the humidity high. And about five weeks later, the, the graft union has healed and there's new shoots coming out of it. So bald cypress is pretty simple. It's pretty easy to graft. That works out pretty well. We did some pines years ago. Um, same type of thing. Here's our root stock. Where we cut it off, stripped some needles, made this incision into our root stock, prepared our scion by stripping off the needles and creating a, a nice little wedge shape here. You can see where they're inserted. We use this clothespin pin basically just to hold it together. Um, wrap a budding rubber around it, used our paraffin wax to seal it up and Eight weeks later, just kept them in the greenhouse. Eight weeks later, these buds broke and off they grow. We've got these plants growing at the station today. Budding is another type of grafting um, that you'll see. It's really, it's quick. Uh, it uses good utilization of, of plant material. Um, it's generally done in the summer. Um, tea budding is, is the kind that, that we do most often where this is our root stock. So you make a T-shaped incision across the top, down the length of it. And again, this usually happens in June, May or June, as the, um, the plant tissue is soft and green. And then you peel that back to expose the cambium and we insert the bud right into that um, into that, that T-shaped inc incision that you, that you created. Wrap a budding rubber around it and, and wait for about a year. Um, generally, you let it grow for that summer and the following spring, you cut it off. This is one that we did, a pear that we did last fall. Uh, so I took this picture just yesterday. So this is the pear seedling that was growing, created the T incision here, cross horizontal, vertical, inserted the new bud, and you can see all the callus tissue that developed around it. It's sealed in there nice. It's got good color on the bark. Um, when it starts to grow, in the spring when this bud starts to break and looks like that, we'll cut the top off and you got your new plant started. Pretty, um, I don't wanna say it's simple, but it's, it's pretty straightforward and can be done with, with some practice. Last thing I wanna point out is for you, the homeowner, the, purchase, the purchaser of new plants, almost every tree, shade tree, or mill tree that you buy at the nursery has been grafted almost every one of them. So when you go to the nursery to buy plants and you see this line, different bark textures, this line, a little bit of swelling maybe, you're supposed to see that. That's the graft union. Um, that's okay. Don't, don't shy away from that and think that there's something wrong with the plant. That's supposed to be there. Different bark textures, if we align, uh, often you know the, the root stock will grow a little bit faster so it might be larger diameter than the top. That's okay. Don't shy away from that. That's, that's supposed to be there. Wow, I think I have used up my time. I think we can handle some questions maybe, and it's been really fun going over this so far. All right, yeah, that's been a great presentation. I've enjoyed that greatly, um, but I know we do have a handful of questions to cover. And so if we can get to a few of those here before one, we'll do that. So I'll invite um, Kala to take us away on the Q&A. All right, so we've got a couple questions. Um, the first one is related to that fogging chamber. Um, when you're fogging and misting very frequently, how do you keep mold down on the cuttings and in that chamber? Good question. So we start with we start with clean cuttings. We start with um, clean facilities. So the chamber's clean. Everything's clean. Hopefully, we're going to get rooting in six to eight weeks on most of our stuff. Um, so while we may see a little bit of algae develop on some of the surfaces, we don't see a lot of mold or disease in that time. Um, they can be cleaned during the process. If we see things start to grow up, you could get in there with some like Xerotol, um, hydrogen peroxide, and you could spray the surfaces down and clean the surfaces. But in general, as long as you start with clean stuff, we don't see that as a problem. If you're getting like really bad mold development quickly, then there's, there's a D 
deeper problem that needs to be addressed. Okay. The next question, um, we have an attendee that works in a business that has an existing plant dealer license. Okay. What legal considerations should they take to propagate and sell plants for retail? Outstanding question. So a lot of the cultivars that are on the market today um, are patented. And quite honestly, you are not legally allowed to, you can propagate all day you want, but you can't sell those. You can, for your own home landscape or something like that, you can propagate it and stick it in your, in your home landscape. Um, but it is not legal to propagate and sell a plant patented plant a plant that has been patented. So it, it's easy to look up. So several of those books that I mentioned, um, you, you open it up and it'll say, it'll give a plant patent number or a quick Google search of the cultivar you wanna grow will tell you, any of the nurseries that are growing it will tell you whether or not it's patented. So make sure your plant isn't patented. If it isn't, then it's open access. You can propagate and sell all you want. Okay. Um this was question related to the mound grafting. Um, is there a difference between the adventitious roots versus true roots or do they work the same? Good questions. Um, so adventitious roots are, are different initially. So that's why newly rooted cuttings or the mound layering stuff, um, that's why those plants take a little extra care once they're planted into the field or into a pot, they're generally staked. Um, but those roots quickly develop the same function structure as, as a, a seedling root system would. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't shy away from those adventitious roots at all. There's millions of plants sold every year from adventitious roots. Okay, um, another question. If you want to just do one or two cuttings from a shrub, is it possible to do them outside or is it best to do those indoors? Um, they're doing viburnums. Wow. So I, I will say this, um, viburnums are are viburnums can be tricky to root. Um, so you'll probably want to take all the precautions you can. Um, if, if you have access to some mist or some fog or um, viburnums are not really easy to root. So that it usually takes a little bit of skill to get that done, depending on the exact species or cultivar you're, you're, you're talking about. Um, so definitely keep them out of the sunlight. Definitely use a root promoting hormone. Definitely keep the humidity as high as you can, um, but viburnums can, can be difficult. So be patient, be stubborn, and expect to fail before you succeed. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, this individual, their um, dad used to wrap privet hedge cuttings in newspaper and bury them in the fall. He then retrieved them in the spring. Um, is that an option? What so are that, your thoughts? Yeah, that's funny. That's that's. I'm glad to hear you say your dad used to do that because that that's old school hardwood propagation. Um, those those 1927 books that I mentioned will will say that. So for a lot of hardwood cuttings, um, that's the way they used to do hardwood cuttings on relatively easy to root stuff. Take a bunch of cuttings wrap it in burlap, moist burlap, bury it in the ground. And basically what happens during that time, the ground keeps it relatively insulated, keeps it from freezing. And over the winter, over those months, the, the base of those cuttings, they begin to callus, you get some cell division down there. And hopefully in the spring, when you take them out, they've already, not that they've already started to root, but they're ready to root. There's a bunch of callus tissue on there. There's probably root primordia on there. So then they, you stick them in the ground or you stick them in the propagation facility and they're ready to go. So it's kind of like preconditioning them to, to rooting. And, that, and that, that's an old school hardwood propagation technique. That's great. Okay, one final question. Um, how to propagate a heritage apple tree? 
um, grafting, cuttings, your recommendation. How to propagate an old heritage ap apple. So if you want to propagate and clone that plant, so we just went through this with the pear, the, 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 the last one of the last things I showed you. Um, if you want to propagate that apple tree, it's important to you, I would collect some fruit off that apple tree, germinate the seeds off that apple tree, so they will start in the spring, um, grow those seedlings out, and in the late summer, if they're big enough, bud onto those, um, bud onto those seedlings, or graft onto them in, in the winter. Um, but yeah, you want, you're gonna wanna graft or bud because cuttings of apples won't root. Um, but if you want to clone, you got to bud or graft. Just grow some seedlings from it first because then you know you got, they're compatible because it's the same plant. All right. Well, thanks again, Jason. Uh, lots of good questions. And we typically always have a few more questions than we can get to, but we will be linking several articles and resources on the website. <clears throat> and so hopefully those will be able to answer additional questions. Uh, once again, wanna thank everybody for joining the K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. Uh, great that you could be with us today to, to learn about vegetative plant propagation. And we do have several interesting sessions coming up. So definitely be sure to visit the Garden Hour website, uh, look at those upcoming topics and uh, and if you want to also make a donation to support us, we'd appreciate that as well. Uh, this session was recorded and will be posted on the website by tomorrow afternoon. And after the, web, after the webinar ends today, you'll also receive a prompt to take an evaluation survey. And so we greatly appreciate your feedback on today's presentation. Uh, and if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us at gardenhour at ksu.edu. Um, thanks again. We'll definitely look forward to seeing you on the first Wednesday of each uh, month uh, as we go forward. Have a great, great week.